Thank you very much, Adam, and thanks for coming early in the morning. Uh, my name is Alexis Roos. I am Director of Machine Learning in uh, Sales Cloud, and I'm here with Brad today to discuss how we are building a graph uh, from activity data, from communications data, to power intelligent services. I will start by a brief Salesforce introduction. I will go over then uh, why context matters uh, for what we're doing for AI, and why we use a graph, and Brad will then go over our platform, explain some of the graph uh, services we built, and finally, we'll wrap up. Uh, this presentation will cover so future developments, and Salesforce being a public, uh, publicly traded company, I have to remind you to only make purchasing decisions based on products that are commercially available today. That's for the disclaimer. Uh, so Salesforce has essentially built a customer success platform uh, that essentially allows our users you know, to um, support their uh, customers through a variety of interactions, ranging from marketing, acquiring customers, sales, uh, uh, developing those customers, service, customer, and so forth. And as such, in the last few years, we've embarked into adding AI right into our platform and all our applications to deliver the, small, uh, the, the world's smallest CRM. And we have made lots of investments and continue to make a lot of investment around intelligent uh, related company, whether we're looking at BI, machine learning, or deep learning. And the goal is to use the customer data we have and to make essentially all our applications smarter. Uh, Salesforce has a lot of customers. We have over 200,000 customers, and we have a lot of room for ma making applications smarter, whether we're talking about lead scoring, uh, case classification, chatbots, and so on. And today, we are specifically going to discuss what we do in a sales cloud uh, related, uh, related to activity data. So our team has developed a platform uh, to enhance the CRM experience, uh, the customer relationship management experience, using activity data, uh, such as emails, phone calls, tasks. So we have some data in the CRM already, but users can also obtain their activity data in our system. And our platform automatically capture and federate uh, those activities for a user, but also across users uh, for a given CRM opportunity. So we have the ability to join all the activities for all the people involved in an opportunity. A CRM opportunity will typically involve an account manager, a sales rep, a bunch of SEs, and a bunch of customer people, and we can federate that. And uh, we have developed email insights, which allows to extract uh, relevant insights in the emails in real time, such as, for instance, is there a pricing discussion? Is there competition being mentioned? Is there an executive being involved? Allowing essentially to, to surface those insights so our users can take actions uh, and can take the necessary you know, uh, appropriate actions based on those activities. And we also support uh, uh, tracking of uh, uh, feedback and directly through some of the actions we offer or directly as well to keep on improving the user experience. Uh, today we will not cover, about, we will not discuss that. We've done a number of talks on that section and for that part on the email inside side, we're doing a lot of NLP. So these days we're doing a lot of work around like uh, 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 deep learning, RNN, LSTM networks, but we're also using Spark because we do uh, structure streaming for that. And emails are complicated if they require a lot of data prep. So we have a lot of data prep. Uh, to take apart the emails and be able to remove signature, confidential notice, reply chain before we go about scoring those emails. And today what we're going to talk about uh, is like what we do uh, at the bottom of the graph that we call contextual services, which is taking those emails, taking the communication data, and essentially creating a graph uh, to organize content, knowledge about that communication data that we can in turn use for machine learning, but also deliver uh, new services. And we'll discuss actually, and Brad will discuss some of the services we built basically based on that data. Uh, so I mentioned contextual services. So what is context and why does it matter for AI? So in addition to be able to score uh, those activities such as email in real time, being able to use historical data is very important. As you can imagine, it's important to score an email, but also understand the context surrounding that email. Is it coming from you know, an important customer, prospect, and so forth? And all the uh, leading AI apps all use context to improve you know, their experience. For instance, Amazon will use you know, contextual information about you to make you know, their recommendations better. 
And in the future, in next generation AI, it will become more and more clear that knowledge representation, context will become more and more key to improve accuracy of AI over time. So let's discuss how we organize and leverage some of the context. But first, so, uh, so we are dealing with you know, enterprise uh, data. So there are uh, notable differences uh, between consumer and enterprise data and a lot of uh, differences and a lot of things we have to do. Uh, mostly in the enterprise, the user isn't a product, but it's a customer. So as such, we have a lot of capabilities that we have to support, including data security, auditing, but also retention, privacy, and GDPR. Um, and the trust is our number one value at Salesforce. We host a lot of customer data. We work with a lot of customer data. So we have to make sure that the customer uh, can still retain control, full control of their data. And it impacts who we acquire data, uh, manage data, even create you know, machine learning uh, for those customers. And the context also in that case of what we're talking about here, we have to scope it uh, uh, at maybe at the user level, at the team level, or at the organization level. At best, we just cannot share data across organizations because, as you can imagine, our customers don't want their data to be shared with other companies or you know, competitors. The context we have also is very rich. In the case of the enterprise uh, space, we have like dozens, hundreds of different types of data uh, that can be used uh, to essentially uh, know about uh, our, our customers. And in our case, it's also very dynamic. So we deal with communications data, so it's happening. Uh, pretty fast, it's changing, you know, and being enhanced, you know, dynamically. So we have to be able to handle uh, speed. So for our customers, you know, the context <coughs> enables us to deliver uh, deeper insights. Uh, this allows, for instance, to classify an email beyond the, just the content of that single email, which is, how oh, well do I know the sender? Uh, uh, is the email uh, essentially discussing my product my company product and services, or is it discussing competitors? Uh, who on my organization can help uh, sell to a given individual or company? Uh, can I get more background information about the company or the type of product and services you know, they are selling? Can I identify the decision maker within that organization uh, and automatically get an introduction? So you can see that there are a lot of things you know, we can do once we have in a context about users and the organization. Uh, now that you understand some of the benefits of acquiring and leveraging context, we will talk about uh, why we use essentially a graph to, to model that data. So as you might realize, that the graph is the ultimate data structure to encode a complex relationship. As I mentioned before, we have a very rich set of uh, data uh, related to our user, and uh, graph is the natural data structure. Some of our organization uh, may have you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of contacts or millions of contacts that extend beyond the organization because some of the organization will have you know, in excess of 10,000 users and they'll have like, uh, essentially a lot of external contact and so they will have you know, millions of events you know, every week. And we want to capture you know, those uh, interaction over time and model that as a graph in order to provide contextual services for machine learning but also derive new services. And Brad will talk about some of the services we built, such as, for instance, recommended connection. Uh, uh, so if you look, for instance, at the top uh, uh, right, uh, we have a simple, essentially, image stream that shows you uh, email being shared you know, at various times you know, between you know, sender and recipient. And you can see at the bottom that we'll essentially construct a graph related to uh, those emails, and at the bottom, we will have the CRM users, the internal users, and at the top, we will have essentially the customers uh, that are part of that communication. In reality, the graph is much larger, right? One org at a time, and we'll have uh, a mechanism to continuously update you know, that graph, and, and, and Brad will talk about that. Uh, so the graph, as we mentioned, the goal for us is to uh, generate context for machining. We'll organize more and more knowledge over time to know which, event are re which emails are relevant. And we want to be able to uh, use that to essentially reinforce our models. But the email insights we're getting based on the content of the email, we can also push that back onto the graph. So now we can enrich relationships. Not only we know how people are connected, but we know how they're connected, right? And what kind of interactions you know, do they have? 
and, 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 and eventually are they discussing about pricing? Is it like engineering? Is it sales? Is it marketing? And so forth. But then in addition to, uh, the graph can essentially be used in a standalone to deliver those new uh, services. So Bright in particular, we talk about recommended connection, or we organize that, and how we can make our sales rep you know, smarter to acquire and go after new, uh, new leads or new uh, people within an account. And essentially, uh, by organizing context and by doing machine learning and kind of doing that feedback loop, we can continuously improve the context and also the services we deliver you know, based on that context. Uh, Brian will actually do the bulk of the presentation, but before uh, uh, he does that, I just wanted to, to give one more thought on some of the work we're doing. Uh, graph is great you know, for modeling context. It's still an acti active area of research as far as how using you know, ML you know, and deep learning you know, on the graph. Um, these are some of the thoughts we had so far. Uh, for some of the insights, we really worried about making sure those insights you know, are accurate and they also can be scaled and composed. So one of the things we realized you know, early on was to develop context-free insights. So what we have, what we want to have context, we want to develop contextual-free insights. So for instance, uh, doing an insight that would be uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, a pricing uh, request might be difficult because a pricing request will involve knowledge and understanding of the product and services that the company is selling. And typically, if you're doing supervised learning and you want to you know, eventually label data, it's very hard to know what are the product and services of the company. So instead, what we did is like we have an email inside that is essentially pricing discussion. Is the email about a pricing discussion? And then we can mix and match that with like uh, essentially uh, 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 product uh, detection because we can also look at what products uh, the company is selling based on like the information that they have in the CRM and then and then we can look composition as we mentioned we feed back the inside the email insights into the graphs so we have that feedback loop and we can continually uh, improve uh, the way we do uh, those additional services we've done a number of experiments using deep learning on graph a lot of folks right now are doing things like uh, enhancing you know, edges or attributes. Uh, we've done some work actually on deep work and looking at uh, random work on the graph to do things like that person A. Uh, 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 person A is similar to person B, like C is similar to person D. So you can do some interesting you know, associations there. Uh, they are still, it's still an acti active area of research. There are a lot of challenges dealing with uh, deep learning and machine learning on graph is, is, is difficult based on the, the, the shape of the data. But there are ways you can, you can essentially create features, you know, create poor, powerful features out of the graph. Uh, I think I'm about out of time, and now we'll let Brad uh, come over and do the bulk of the, the talk. OK, hello, uh, everyone. So now uh, we want to talk a little bit about the platform that we've built and also some of the products we've built off of it. And so uh, I'm really going to start with uh, kind of the bird's eye view. And we'll kind of zoom into what products we've created and then zoom into uh, some code around, some simplified code around one particular product. So try to give you the whole kind of notion of, of what we've done here. Uh, before I get to that point, though, I want to acknowledge uh, the team that's working with me on this product. Uh, and platform that's Noah Burbank and Gabriel Krupa. Uh, these guys actually started working on it before I did, so uh, it is appropriate for me to recognize that fact that they've given this fertile ground that that uh, I'm now uh, planting in. Okay, so uh, here's the high-level view. Um, as Alexi mentioned, we uh, have people that opt into Einstein Activity Capture. If you do that and you're one of our customers, then uh, we crawl your inboxes and your calendars to generate an activity stream. Uh, that activity stream in turn, uh, in turn gets placed into a Kafka queue and eventually persisted in an activity store, uh, which is basically an S3 bucket. OK, and so from there, we get into this sort of peach rectangle, which is where we begin to operate. So from that activity store, we take those meetings and emails. Uh, and from that, we build out this uh, contact graph. And uh, you know, we onboard a new company from nothing, just, just its data. But then, as Lexi mentioned, you also need the capacity to be able to uh, read a past graph uh, from uh, a different S3 bucket and then take new activity data 
uh, and then merge it with the existing graph and then write out a new graph. Okay? And so what you see here is that we are persisting graphs and we do uh, work in, in a batch process here. Okay, so this is kind of the creation and maintenance of this raw graph. Uh, but then also we need to deliver uh, services. And so from uh, a raw graph, we have a completely sort of separate set of operations where we're enriching that raw graph, we're creating products from that raw graph, and we're uh, inde indexing uh, data out to uh, a store that our clients can access through a, re a REST interface. Okay, so there's a real separation of concerns here, right? We have the graph maintaining, uh, keeping it fresh, and then we have uh, products and services that we can build by enhancing that graph. And that's sort of the theme. That was a very conscious architectural decision. Uh, we wanted a sort of a fail safe that we'd always have a raw graph we could go back to. We also wanted the ability to branch off different products in different directions, which maybe is, is not efficient, but it's, it's very flexible. Okay, so. Uh, we, uh, uh, one, one, I guess one other thing I want to mention about this is we just use kind of email and meeting metadata. So we don't store the email bodies themselves in the graph for various reasons. One of which is, is size because it would increase the size of the graph by orders and orders of magnitude. And so this is really about relationships between people, uh, but we don't have the email data. And that's important and it'll come up later. Okay. so. Uh, before we get into that, I want to kind of zoom in to this uh, updating and loading part of our architecture. Okay, so again, we have the activity store uh, where the kind of the raw email and meeting data are stored, and then we have the S3, the other S3 store where uh, we have graphs stored. And so from that store, we have to take this activity data and turn it into uh, vertices and edges in the graph. And the vertices in the graph themselves are people, right? They're not just people, but they are people. They're people and then data about that person. Okay, and so we consolidate those uh, as tuples of an identifier, a vertex ID, and the contact uh, itself, okay? And then the events are uh, the relationships between people. So each, each event, each email, each meeting ends up being stored on an, on an edge. Okay, so it has an edge type. Uh, what's stored within that edge is a collection of events. Okay, so what matters, this is a directed graph. So if I send an email to Alexi, then the edge goes from me to Alexi. If, when he sends one to me, another edge comes from him to me. But if he sends five emails to me, all five emails are stored on that edge from him to me, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's where we come up with uh, new vertices and new uh, edges, and then we need to join that with the existing vertices and edges in the graph, okay? And we do that via, uh, we use uh, GraphX, um, and so we use uh, the RDD data structure for storing uh, contact and edge information, okay? And then so from all that, we, get, we go from this previous raw graph that's yellow to this updated uh, raw graph that's, that's freshly updated, uh, that's shown in green over there. And we update these things uh, roughly on a weekly basis. We find that the graph data is pretty static. It doesn't, I shouldn't say it that way, its time constant is pretty long. So updating on the order of a week uh, is sufficient and it gives a lot of flexibility for our infra team. Okay, so uh, as, as Alexi mentioned, each customer of Salesforce who opts into Einstein Activity Capture they get their own graph, right? We can't have one giant graph. Uh, I mean, I guess, I suppose we could with really complicated uh, permissions uh, for who could see what, but what we do is we have basically a separate graph for each org uh, that we service. And because of that, and because of the number of customers we're talking about, uh, scale does play a role. Um, so Salesforce itself has hundreds of thousands of customers. Uh, around 10% of which have opted in for Einstein activity capture to this point. Um, and for particularly large orgs, we're talking on the scale of 10,000 users, roughly. Okay, so these are 10,000 people whose inboxes, whose calendars are being crawled. Uh, 
and then one million contacts. And this is important because most people that we have on the graph, we don't, they're not our customers. They're just people who happen to interact with our customers, right? And this will come up and it'll be, it'll be important later when we talk about some of the, the features uh, that we deliver. And then finally, a, a large org might have on the order of, and I think Alexi mentioned this, around uh, one million activity events per day, many of which are not useful because they're various forms of corporate spam uh, or meeting rooms that are emailing people, et cetera. Some of which can be interesting, but many of which we need to uh, filter away. <coughs> OK, so our system basically has to work well uh, in this sort of an environment. And because of this scale, we face kind of the classic trade-off of this tension between the size of this graph and what we can do with it, right? So gosh, we'd like it to be as big as possible because then we could do lots and lots of things with it on one hand. On the other hand, the bigger it is, the more expensive it is computationally, storage-wise, uh, engineering support-wise, et cetera, uh, GDPR-wise. OK, so let's talk about one example of where this might be important, uh, and this is name resolution. So when someone emails you, uh, you see their email address, you oftentimes also see a name associated with that email, right? So you might see, like if I email you, you might see bpowley at salesforce.com, and then next to that it would say Brad Powley, right? So that name is what I'm talking about here. Now, we might crawl a bunch of different names for an individual. We often do. So in this particular case, we crawled uh, various names for this fictional person. Uh, his name is Urban Ulysses. So we crawled that name. We crawled U Ulysses. We crawled Not Odysseus, and we crawled Herbs. OK, so all these names. And the question is, well, which one is his name? What do, you, what do people think? Herbs. Herbs, yeah. So for a person, uh, this is pretty easy to figure out, right? It's probably the top one. And you could design a machine, learn, uh, a machine learning algorithm to go through and, and figure that out. But you could do this really accurately with just heuristics if you just had a little more data. Like what, what kind of data would you want in order to be able to disambiguate which name it is? What's that? Yeah, is it like in a first name, last name format? You might also want to know, for example, did, this, did a particular email where a, a particular name was crawled from, did it come from that person? So in other words, if I send an email to you, well, we're pretty sure, if it's my business account, we're pretty sure I got my name right, right? If, you, if, if Cody, for example, sends an email to me, he might, have, he might be using my nickname, right? So that has a little less power. Yes? But if I shorten my, my first name? Right, so there may be nicknames, et cetera, right? So you, you wanna have, you, you'd want to have a little more information in order to be able to determine a good name. And you think, well, why is this important? You know your users' names, right? Well, actually, like we talked about before, there's an order of magnitude more people on the graph who we do not know who they are. They just happen to interact with people who are our customers. So we really need to get this right, right? So what kinds of information might you want? You might want to know whether or not the name was used in an email sent by this person. We talked about that. You might want to know how many events. So if we can have some frequency distribution over how often each one of these is used, that might also give us a clue. It's probably not as good as the first one, but not everybody on the graph has sent an email, right? They may have just been receiving emails, so we may have no data on the first bullet. And you might want to know something about, say, the recency of use in the name. And so this is just an example of, of data that may not seem important, but you'd actually kind of like it to be able to keep it on the graph to be able to disambiguate names. OK, so you do that, and then you know from our system, you get a resolved name, and it's Urban Ulysses, and we're pretty sure it's right, right? So we picked a name based on that. OK, so uh, let's talk about uh, another example. So this uh, is in, you know, a lot of people are, are th talking about privacy, uh, given GDPR lately, but we actually can think about privacy requests beyond just GDPR. And here's an example. So suppose you get a request. Your system ad, uh, admin gets a request to remove graph data derived from events that include our CEO, our board member, and a competitor CEO. And why might that request come in? Well, maybe they're talking about an acquisition. There may be some SEC reason. You don't want just any user of the graph to be able to go in and infer that some big talks are going down, right? So, uh, so this request comes in. What kinds of information would you need to know in order to be able to uh, basically wipe these events from the graph? What do people think? The 
CEO you, you need to know which vertices are the CEO, right? You need to know which vertices are the competitor CEO. Also, they ask about the month of April. You need to know when these events happen. So that is, these are data you want to keep because if you're going to be able to fulfill requests like these, you need to keep that data. So uh, we talk about that. You know, you want the timestamp for the event. You want some way, some means of identifying all the people you want to be able to remove from the graph. And so given that, uh, you can remove all events that include these CEOs and any board member within that time window. And then if you recall, edges are collections of events. They contain collections of events. And so any edge whose events were all removed should itself be removed. So now all, any sort of interaction between those people during that time frame have been removed from the graph. Okay. So this trade-off is pretty straightforward when we're talking about something really concrete, which is why I was asking you about this. But the, te the tension really becomes, or the trade-off is much less clear for features you haven't made yet. Right? So these are very, two very simple features, two simple requests. But you have to think about the future and like what might we be able to do with this. And so that, that's difficult. You'd like to be conservative and to keep as much info on the graph as possible. OK, so the way we address this is by having multiple graphs. So uh, this raw graph that we've been talking about, we just have that, the one we persist, we persist that with a large amount of data. Basically, we're, we're keeping as much of the metadata uh, as we can in that graph. And that gives us this optionality on new features. So if it's there, then we, could, then we can use it in the future. Uh, it also allows us to branch more uh, different kinds of features uh, you know, by building enhanced graphs uh, off of that raw graph. Okay, so we can like branch one kind of feature with one kind of enhanced graph. Uh, we can branch another kind of feature with another kind of enhanced graph, all the while never changing the, the root raw graph that exists, and all the while being able to, to fail safe to that raw graph should we need to. Okay, so uh, let's talk about that enhanced graph. So an enhanced graph or graphs can deliver these insight-specific uh, results with faster processing. So when we go to create a feature, we take the raw graph, we as quickly as possible remove irrelevant data from, that, from the raw graph that we need in order to make this feature so we can run very quickly. And from that, we can distill this raw graph data into more useful summary information, like the preferred name of the contact, like event-weighted edges. So, uh, you know, we just want to know the strength of connection between people. Uh, that can be just encoded as uh, an int, right, ultimately in many cases. Uh, and also the contact's closest connection. So these are just some examples of this. So uh, it, it's, it's important to mention that we never persist any of these enhanced graphs, right? They just get created as part of a pipeline toward a product from the raw graph. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that pipeline. So we've already seen how we get from S3 to a raw graph that's been updated appropriately. Uh, what are the next steps? Well, um, we do uh, various tagging, like shared account tagging. So for example, in many cases, salespeople will use the same email account uh, for, for example, marketing messages and things like this. So there may be a single email address, but you know, a bunch of our names are on that email account, like my name's on the account, Narek's name's on the account, Cody's name's on the account, Alexi's name's on the account. And that's not a person. The graph is about people, right? It's, it's, it's a set of people. And so we want to be able to tag those shared accounts. Uh, we want to be able to uh, trim edges and lightweight the graph as much as possible that we talked about earlier. So any information that's not relevant and material to making this ultimate product, we want to get out as soon as possible in the pipeline. Uh, we'll do some very basic entity resolution. Things like, uh, you know, if, if uh, the, like my email address, we have one that's bpally, and there's one that's bpally1, one that's bpally2, et cetera. Uh, we can do some kind of basic kind of email related entity resolution. And from that, we get this kind of partially enhanced lightweight graph. Okay, so this gets us most of the way there, but we're not to a product yet. In fact, uh, we do some more tagging, like of suspicious accounts. So if you have, uh, if your name is like the name of something that has the word conference room in it, for example, we want to tag that. We'll do some even deeper entity resolution where we'll look at. Um, you know, if, if there are two contacts, one of, uh, we, we suspect they're both me, uh, what we do is we look at those two contacts' closest connections. If there's a strong enough overlap between those, then we can get to better entity resolution. And then finally, we get to in-org tagging. So by that I mean uh, in-org is 
our customers inside of our customers org. So it's not people they're selling to. So out of org in this case is people they'd sell to. We really want to make a strong distinction between people who are in org and people who are out of org uh, because it's really important for the features that we generate. And so from all of that, we get an enhanced graph. We do product transformations on that enhanced graph. And then we uh, populate the online index. OK, so uh, uh, whew, we finally got through all of this. Now we can talk about some, some products we've built on the graph, some very specific ones. OK, so our first one is recommended connections. So here's the problem. We're back to Urban. He's a salesperson who wants to get an introduction to Tasha. This is Tasha. Uh, and Tasha is an important lead. He knows that Tasha is someone he wants to get an introduction to. And how can he go about doing that? Well, that's where our recommended connections product comes into play. We can look at kind of the strength of edges between uh, Tasha and her nearest neighbors. And that strength can be related to timing, like how recently they've interacted, uh, whether or not they've had meetings versus emails, um, and whether or not they have reciprocated emails. So in some cases, you have sort of these uh, windbags where they just ki kind of keep slamming someone and they never get an email back. That's not an indication of a very strong connection. It's, it's strong. As soon as you get an email back, it's like that's an, indis uh, an indication of a stronger connection. And so from that, we can give kind of some scores uh, to each of Tasha's closest connections to see which ones are the best connected to her. Okay? And from that, we see that uh, Andrea is the closest connection uh, to Tasha. And so the solution is uh, we serve to uh, Urban that uh, Tasha's closest connections are Andrea's the strongest and Basker's the medium connection. He knows Andrea. Now he knows who to go to to get the introduction to Tasha. That makes sense? All right. So let's talk about the, oh, uh, sorry, one other thing. Uh, we sort of have a value on our team that wherever possible we try to serve a rationale as well so that it's not so black boxy, right? So that we can give a rationale that says Tasha and Andrea emailed each other several times in the past month. Like why do they have a strong connection? Well, this is why. This is why we say that. Um, yeah. In this example, is Tasha in the same organization as Urban or not? Most likely not. not. Right? Yeah. So uh, Tasha might be someone that Urban wants to sell to. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, powerful there distinction. Privacy implications there? Uh, sorry, the question? Are there Pri privacy implications there? Um, say more about that. Um, like maybe Tasha or Andrea doesn't want to know that there were specifically emailed or in person meetings. Oh, uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, so uh, there may be, and that sort of gets back to the feature we talked about earlier about um, you know the CEO example, and do you want um, to be able to you know know that that like for example, if I can click on Mark Benioff and I see oh he's emailed and what so there has to be a mechanism to be able to remove that information from the graph. Yeah, uh, let me let me uh, table that until the end just to make sure we have enough time if that's okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, we're close. Um, okay, so uh, the next two out of the three products we'll mention. This one's called Contact Mentioned, and this is sort of a, uh, a mix between email insights that Alexi talked about and uh, contextual services. And so here's the problem. Uh, so Urban gets an email from a client that mentions Ugo, uh, and Ugo is a person that, Ur that Urban does not know well. Okay, so here's the email in its body. And again, this is part of our structured streaming email insights side of the house. So the email says, before you send a quote to Sarah, we should first convince Ugo that your product can help Service Co achieve its goals. OK, so through named entity recognition, we can figure out that there's a name here. And the question is, what do we do about that name? Uh, is Ugo someone that's important? Is it someone that should be mentioned? And so the solution is that we do this kind of automated review of each of the participants' connections. Okay, so we look, the participants are Urban, Sarah, and Rhea. Rhea was the sender. We look at Rhea's closest connections, and oh, it looks like Ugo could be Ugo Garcia. Right? He shows up there. We look at Sarah's, hey, he shows up again. And he doesn't show up in Urban's. And so we can say, ah, we're pretty sure that Ugo, in this case, is Ugo Garcia. Looks like you've never interacted with Ugo. So we can say to you, would you like to view Ugo, Ugo Garcia's contact information? Right? So there's a quick like one-click uh, method to get from this email to the person they're talking about. Okay? So that's contact mentioned. And then the third example is influencer identification. 
And so the problem is, and we talked about this before, so Urban wants to get an introduction to someone at Widget Corp. Now, in this case, he does, before he knew he wanted to talk to, to Tasha, right? But this is the, the use case where he knows he wants to get in at an organization, but he doesn't really know where to start, right? And so he wants to get an intro here. This company has high potential, but he doesn't really know where to start. And so uh, the solution we have is uh, kind of a two-part solution, part one of which is uh, the, our algorithm, our influencer algorithm, finds a person who is both well-connected and has shown a willingness to reciprocate within the graph. And in doing that, it identifies that she, uh, for no, node X here, is the influencer at Widget Corp. And it gives a rationale. So among a group of five people, she, she is particularly well-connected, having sent emails and met with three people. Okay? And so that's step one. And then step two is, okay, so this is the influencer. So the, the logical next step is, is, well, how do I get an introduction to this person? Right? To whom do I turn for this intro? And so now we go back to recommended connections. And Urban can learn that Esconder, his coworker, is well connected to she. And so now he knows like, a set of next steps to get to she. C can I table that just until the very end? Yeah, thank you. OK. So. Uh, Let's see, how much time do we have? Five minutes. All right, I'll talk about this very quickly. So we have three methods to identify influencers. Um, the first one is we need some way of separating this large like universe into some small worlds in the graph. And so we need something that will uh, enable us to make cliques in the graph. Uh, we also, then once we have those cliques, we need to figure out like how to score someone's influencer ness, right? as you might call it, like how strong of an influencer are they in that clique? And then once you have a, like a distribution of scores uh, over the clique, how do you go about choosing which person should be deemed as an influencer? So we have this namer function as well. OK, so uh, for this clique maker function, this is, I'll mention this because it's interesting. So our graphs tend to be these scale invariant power law graphs. And Researchers that do work in these uh, know that the way to break these sort of networks up is to find the supernodes and remove them. Okay, so this is the way to do it. Uh, people that look at you know, breaking up terrorist networks, et cetera, use these kinds of approaches. Well, it turns out that who are those people in our graphs? They're our users, right? The people whose, whose inboxes we're crawling are the ones that are the supernodes in our graphs. So we already have tagged which people, and that's why this in-org tagging is so important. We've tagged which people we need to remove. We do that, we can get to uh, this graph full of cliques and small worlds. And so uh, I'm going to skip through the scorer and the namer. I think that's pretty straightforward. The scorer puts scores on the graph based on uh, the connectivity. Uh, in this case, I have just like a one-liner using page, a reverse page rank to be able to figure that out. Uh, you can use any number of, of algorithms to show this. And then you need some means of saying, hey, you know, above some threshold, we're going to call this person an influencer. Okay? And then, of course, we want to give a rationale at the end. Why is it that you've tagged this person as such? OK, so let's wrap it. Um, so one of the messages, key messages from our talk is that context gives us a deeper meaning to data. It's good to have this context. Um, we can do more interesting, more meaningful features for people who use our products when we understand kind of how they interact. Uh, the next is that a uh, graph is a powerful data representation, and it's a great way of encoding context. And I've heard some complaints about Spark here this week. We're, we're uh, you know, no, nothing's perfect, but we feel like Apache Spark and Graphics uh, have done a reasonable job for us and have provided a reasonable platform for us in providing these contextual services. And finally, I think uh, what Alexi talked about, this sort of um, synergy between email insights and contextual services really go well together. So we don't want to um, save email bodies onto the graph, but we could save insights about email bodies. So we could say, like, hey, this edge contains a pricing discussion, right? And then that helps you give better products based on contextual services. It also gives you a prior distribution when you're trying to score an email. So you might say, like, hey, we're kind of on the edge as to whether or not this is a pricing email, but we look and we see that there have been many pricing emails that have gone back and forth between these two people, and so that helps with that. So with that, um, we're about out of time, and maybe there's time for a couple of questions. Well, there's plenty of time for questions. Okay, great. Um, Do you want to come sure. up? And so first, let's just uh, thank uh, <coughs> and, yeah. Do we have a handheld?
Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe a handout would be better. No. And there's a set of mics under the table. But um, I think we can hear it's a small enough room. So on one side, I would like to ask the question how the graph concept in a buyer's organization uh, coincides or works with the, uh, <clears throat> with the concept that you want to remove all the information about the external contacts of their particular customer. Because your customers are the salespeople, and they write to many, many people, right, outside the organization. So you have like hundreds, many of organizations. So, but you want the information about the buyers to help you. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right, and, and it's, it's just like that. And we have very little information about those people. We only have information based on email metadata and what people talked about. So, um, I, I'm sorry, am I, I, maybe I didn't answer your question. Can, was there a question in there that I missed? Yeah, the question is like how you can, in this situation, how you can help to your customers to get uh, to the proper or appropriate people to the influencers. Oh, how you, how you can help them. If you remove all the kind of spam, Oh, okay. Right. So, so presumably, uh, removing the spam, uh, the the spam that you remove presumably is not relevant to that to the influencer relationships. So, for example, whether or not, um, you know, like uh, an automated email generator uh, is part of that customer organization doesn't help uh, us understand who the influencer in that organization is. Is that answering your question? I feel like I'm not. I'm looking at your face and I, I, I'm not seeing uh, clarity. What's up? Yeah, and another thing is that if I send you, like, I'm a seller, I send you, like, 10 emails, mm -hmm. and you respond to me, don't contact me anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So we will have, like, or let's say 100 emails, and you send it to me back, uh, one or two emails. Uh, and like how it would uh, be reflected in the graph. Right. We would have a yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, kind of a cease and desist email <laughs> is what you're saying. So, uh, yeah, so I think the way that we would handle that is through email insights. So there might be, um, you know, NLP we do on the message that uh, finds these kinds of cease and desist emails, uh, extracts their, that summary of them, and then we add that to the edge on the graph uh, based on that. So just like I talked about, you might have like an insight that, that reads an email and says, hey, pricing was discussed. We'll put a pricing uh, tag on one of the edges in the graph. You could do the same thing with like a cease and desist email. You know, also when we build a graph for recommended connections, we use, as Brad mentioned, uh, more than one feature. So if it's like a one-on-one -on -one email, Gary's less way versus the one too many where multiple people are involved versus meanings, reciprocity, number of emails, recency. So there are a lot of like uh, criteria that are involved to kind of like put that uh, kind of interaction lower than the list. But you can have false positives, like with any, uh, you know, intelligent system. Yeah. But it will go away also over time, right? Because that person will quickly drop down based on no new interaction. Of That's right. I, there was a question in the back. Someone's been had their hand. Thank you for sharing your work. Mm -hmm. so, I've got a couple of questions about the first picture diagram that you had. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is kind of the events and all the data that you're discovering coming through Kafka Stream and then you bring into some sort of activity store. Um, have you ever considered using those streams as the source of data with some sort of a you know, forever retention plan? Um, and if and if that's not possible, I want to understand what sort of like conversion or transformation, how materially the data in the store that's just pretty much aligned from the screen um, is different or would be different from a you know, retention of forever of the screens. I long to. Uh, right, right, right. I don't know. Do you want to take that? Or? Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm not sure I got the question 100%, but from a Strict same point, we're calling those emails in real time, and there are two flows. The flow at the top is processing those emails in real time to deliver those insights because we serve that through Cell Cloud, but also through a print called Salesforce Inbox. So if you use Salesforce Inbox, as you get your email, you get you know immediate you know, notification on the email that, for instance, there's a scaling request and you can take an action. So we do process that in real time uh, for generating insights. For the graph, we do it in batch, and the reason why 
is because not only we build a graph, but we do those higher level calculations on top of the graph, like page rank, you know, already mentioned. In the expensive, you typically cannot do those operations in real time, right? Typically, it's hard to use any kind of large scale distributed database and do like graph operations in real time. So for that, we do that in batch. And then we uh, index it so it can be served online uh, at scale. Uh, do we have time for any more questions, or is uh, that? I think we better stop. Oh, okay. Let's, uh, let's thank Brad and Alexei one more time.